And I remember crying as a kid, just looking out that window and looking at my town kind of slowly disappear. And the way I thought of it was, you know, this is kind of the last time that I'll, that I'll see this. Uh, I think at that point, it just kind of, I guess, sunk in or I understood what it meant to leave. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place for first-hand Cold War history accounts. And make sure you hit that follow button in your podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. In this deeply personal episode, our guest Norbert vividly recounts his traumatic childhood journey from Cold War Poland to the United States. With vivid recollections, he describes the struggles of his parents amid food shortages and the poignant decision for the family to leave everything behind for an uncertain future in the United States. We also explore the cultural shock and the struggle to find identity in a new world as Norbert navigates life as a Polish immigrant in 1980s America, from his first bewildering day at an American school to his father's relentless work ethic in pursuit of the American dream, we witness the sacrifices and choices that shape an immigrant's life. Norbert's narrative unfolds against the backdrop of the Cold War, where his family's German heritage in Poland subjects them to suspicion and prejudice. Our episode starts with his grandfather's story in World War II. I'm delighted to welcome Norbert to our Cold War conversation. When the Nazi regime kind of barreled through, my grandfather decided as a Pole to join the uh, Polish Home Army. And the Polish Home Army was the, the main Polish resistance movement against Nazi occupation. The Polish government go to London and the Polish Home Army uh, allied itself with the exiled Polish government in, in England. I think they took with them the seals of office, which uh, were eventually handed back to the free Polish government in the 1990s, I think. I think that's correct. How did he fare within the, uh, within the home army? Have you got any knowledge of how involved he was? From, from what my dad and my aunt told me that he was very heavily allied on due to his logistic experience with, and everything that pertained to railways. Um, if you look at kind of, that's kind of the rabbit hole that I went down on as far as the, uh, home, home armies, uh, involvement in derailing Nazi trains, um, blowing up bridges. And at the end of the war, the Soviet Red Army has uh, come into Poland to, I'll use liberate in inverted commas, um, and the Home Army is suppressed because it's allied to the Free Polish Government in uh, the UK. So what happens to your grandfather at that point? At the end of the war, he got up to uh, Pukovnik, which essentially loosely translates to um, colonel in, in, in America. And he was asked to go to Moscow to continue his military career and become a general like many of his friends did. But like with the fact that he rejected fascism, he also did not think that the communist regime would be beneficial for the, the Poles. So that effectively ended his uh, military career, career. He had to resign his uh, post. He wasn't, uh, I guess you could say, looked on positively with the way things were changing and evolving post-World War II. How did that affect him by, you know, rejecting that offer to, to go to Moscow and uh, relinquishing his, his commission? Yeah, that's kind of the difficult thing is because when you talk to 
you know, even, even family members that are currently alive that then leave Poland and, or immigrated to other parts of the world, like my family did, people just didn't talk about it on my father's side. Uh, just those kind of topics weren't spoken. Um, and on my mother's side, you know, the way certain people handled coming out of World War II was through uh, great poverty and, and, and alcoholism was, again, as a child, you know, it's, it's, you remember the copious amounts of, of, uh, predominantly vodka, not even, not even beer being part of day-to-day -day life. So you, your father's born in 1950. Correct. Um, what's, what? career what's his education like and what what career does he go into he went to college and he got he received that he he liked law so i don't know if it was it was specifically pre-law or or law in general but when he came out of school he had the opportunity to run what's called the spodzielnia zimishnicza it was essentially co-op it wasn't like a traditional state state store that that was found in poland they had uh, better resources and i guess you can say kind of gave the people a hint of capitalism did he give you any reason why he didn't pursue the career in law after doing the law degree I never actually never really asked. My dad was my dad always had a very good business acumen, and um, he enjoyed working with people. He enjoyed working people, helping people, and working with people. And um, I think his character and personality was more suited for what he ended up doing. And your your mother, what what was her background and story? So my. Mother's family or mother came from Vilno, Lithuania. So again, you had the polar opposite of where my family came from. So when Poland lost Lithuania, the Poles that were residing were told to either take on Russian citizenship or migrate west, which would my grandmother's family and my grandmother did out of Vilno. Did she go to university as well and work? My, my grandmother wasn't educated. My mother got a degree in zoology, uh, but ended up being a stay, stay at home mother when I was born. What were your father's view of the regime? in Poland, the Polish government during this period? So seeing it through and hearing it through a kid's eyes, um, you know, again, it was, n nothing was really spoken in the house at that time. Um, I know that my dad wasn't happy and I know my dad uh, went out a lot. Uh, he hung out with a group of friends and, you know, conversations were, uh, had on a weekly basis, especially when we went out to meet with family members and friends. And the adults were in their circle and the kids were in their circle. And um, my dad had friends that uh, were both uh, anti, anti-communist and he had, we had family members that were part of the, uh, you know, low-level police officers, um, bookkeepers that were party members. And when Solidarity appeared in the early 80s, so Solidarity, the, the free trade union in, in Poland, did that change things in any way? So kind of the early recollections I have was in the early 80s, 81 to 83 period, 84, 
um, you started to see kind of the the movement itself, um, masses of people, flags, uh, flyers, you know, just you know, information being you know handed out to people. Yeah, and did your father join Solidarity? He had friends within the movement, and again, it was mostly a, a workers' movement. And since my dad's intention for many years was to get out, um, the way he explained it to me later in life was that he needed to to keep his nose clean, so to speak, uh, because when he was leaving, the intent was to bring the whole family with him and anything um, that he would have done would have caused difficulties for either him leaving and then obviously getting the rest of the family out of Poland. Was he involved in any opposition activities against the government? When he was younger, um, early, early 80s, my mom said that he they would uh, hide a, a press of sorts or a copying machine and... Uh, you know, they were making flyers or distributing flyers, anti-government flyers. Did he ever get caught doing that or not? He got uh, arrested a couple of times um, that I was m- made aware of. Um, the way it was explained to me was, you know, it was wrong place, wrong time. Again, back during that time, People were just being picked up on the street for uh, sometimes no reason. You know, you were walking down the street and there was something going on. And, and uh, if you were there and, you know, you, you, you got into the back of that, that vehicle with, with the other people. So sometimes it was as simple as being at the wrong place at the wrong time or hanging, hanging around the, you know, uh, the wrong group. So as a as a kid, the the memory, the the recollection I had was uh, that they they arrested my dad, which they came. I guess it was uh, late late at night and early morning, and they axed down down the door, and but my father wasn't home. Um, but I do remember, um, you know, that whole. Because it was a traumatic, you know, experience. No, no kid is, well, very few kids are exposed to that kind of behavior where your door is axed down violently and, you know, strangers barge in. Again, not, not knowing at that time, being so little, why, why, why somebody's here, why they're axing down the door. Uh, that's, you know, kind of information that I found out later uh, as a, and as an adult, um, my, my parents, truly when I uh, would speak to them about these certain situations, had no idea that I had any recollections of, of them happening. Your father is arrested when martial laws declared in 1981. How, how long is he held for? Do you know? Not long. Um, my mother's sister's husband was in the, the Polish militia and the police. He was a photographer and a handwriting expert. So he helped get my father out one or the two instances that he was um, taken in. What, what was day-to-day life like in Poland at that time? I mean, you mentioned difficulty with getting hold of uh, food during that period as a kid i remember we 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 lived in three or four different locations and i spent most of my my young years uh, living with my grandparents because my parents couldn't find find proper housing and they were waiting on the voucher um, most of the People in Poznań, they lived in uh, blocks, these either long 
six story buildings or kind of 20, 30 story buildings where, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people live. And there were these little communities on the outskirts, outskirts or still within Poznań proper, but not in the, what they called old Poznań. And each area had a state store and a church. And as far as the, the food situation is, you were limited to um, the local food being sold by farmers. They would come in, they have a little farmer's market and you can get seasonal vegetables, fruits like apples and pears. And then um, for meat during 81, well, the, the time period that I recall, there was a shortage of a lot of items. Meat was one of them. Uh, coffee, citrus fruit, sugar. Uh, we would we would line up in in lines. I remember me and my grandfather would go on walks on Saturdays, and we just stand in line for two three hours. It felt like an eternity to a kid. And then you'd hear people talking. You know what do they got? This you know oh they got coffee. So you'd stand there you know, for two, three hours. And if you were lucky, you'd walk away with, you know, a cup full of uh, sugar or, um, you know, a third of a pound of coffee beans, bananas, citrus fruit. And and again, it was very limited quantity. So you'd you'd come home with, you know, two, three oranges. So again, looking at it in the hindsight, it was... It was tough, but you, you know, it was, it was not knowing any different. It felt like the norm, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It, it, it does make sense. Absolutely. So you, you're about, uh, seven or eight, I think at this time. So what, what was, uh, schooling like for you? So by the time I went into first grade, I remember we ended up, my dad bought or was, we were able to move into the old part of town, which was very dark and depressing. The lights would go out quite a bit. There were old buildings and it was just not a, it didn't, it didn't feel you know, like a happy place. The school was approximately maybe five, seven minutes walking distance. We had to work, work through the market that we had in our neighborhood. It was just an old, well, it was, it was a newer construction because it didn't fit in, but it, I think it was a 50 step building. And again, it looked like a big, ugly block. And in, inside there was no colors. I remember. Um, you know, they had posters and pictures everywhere. Uh, it was, it was a, I don't want to say scary, but it was an uneasy feeling going to school. It was very regimented and, and it wasn't anything close to what, you know, a typical, typical child would experience in the UK today or in America. Did you have a favorite subject that? time or not or did you just generally not like school well i was during the whole time that i went through third grade i was what they call the vzorove uchen which just means that i excelled academically and i i couldn't tell you whether i liked school or this i disliked learning because even in the early early years, there was a lot of subjects and there was the focus on education was very, it was pushed heavily. And I remember telling my mom that, you know, after hours and hours of whether we we were learning history or geography or math, um, she said, you know, if you think this is hard, we'll wait till in your fourth grade, because in fourth grade, they would start you would start learning Russian and then pick up other subjects 
I mean, like chemistry and physics, which again, for, for a 11 year old can, can be taxing. And your last name is a, is a German name. Did that impact? Yeah. I mean, you know, again, I, I didn't know for many years. I, 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 why, why were the kids calling me a crowd? Um, that was the, 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 one of the nickname or the nickname that the kids called me and, uh, resulted in half a missing tooth uh, and a staircase. The kid pushed me. Then only later, you know, I found out that, you know, kids that were of Germanic, that had Germanic roots, uh, were teased. Not as heavily as my father, what my father experienced, uh, but there were still remnants of that left when, when I was attending school. I mean, did you visit any uh, places dur- during that period? So one of the most fondest memories I have as a child was we traveled a lot and we went on vacations and through school, they would take you to the war museums. And there was a ton of that stuff, you know, just around our town. And then on one of the occasions, I remember we went, I, you know, through the pictures, I know we ended up in Krakow, Krakow, Zakopane. And we also went to Oshinshim, Auschwitz. Uh, yes, and I think I believe it was 80, 80, 81, 82. What What do you remember of that visit to Auschwitz? You know, again, it's one of those things that you know there are these memories that 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 you recall, um, and you know, I remember to this day the 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 crematoriums. Um, again, as as a six year old, go walking through it. I don't think it was as impactful as it has it become over the years. Uh, knowing that, you know, that's that's where we went, and uh, kind of revisiting the 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 path that perhaps my grandfather, you know, would have taken. And, you know, the, the role that the home army played, um, during the war, uh, during the Warsaw uprising and, uh, the fact that they were able to, the home army again, s- um, s- smuggle the information that was relayed uh, th- through, uh, Vitold Pilecki, you're familiar with, I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 The guy so, who escaped from Auschwitz. Yeah. So he volunteered, he, that gentleman volunteered, volunteered to go into Auschwitz and then he uh, passed on the information to the Polish home ar- army, which eventually ended up in the hands of the allies. We spent a lot of time traveling the countryside and we always ended up in memorials or museums um, that were uh, honoring the the deaths and uh, the horrors of World War II. Did you have any uh, best friends during this period? I I had again because school was so so difficult and so demanding. You you kind of had to make friends for two reasons. And number one, you wanted company as a, as a kid and, and have fun. And number two, whenever you, somebody was out sick, it was your responsibility essentially to go to one of your classmates and get the the current homework or find out what you missed in school. So I had, I had uh, two kids, one that I have very fond memories of that I spent a lot of time with. His name is Radek. Um, he lives in Warsaw now. 
and very, very fond memories of us playing as kids. And uh, who was the, the other friend you had? His name was uh, Marek, or Mark in English, and he lived maybe 100 feet. The, we lived in an old building, so if you look down uh, the main street, we lived on the street, it's called Gugovska, older town, just older buildings, and you have you know shops on the ground level, and then you would drive in your car through this kind of archway, and you would, you'd go to the right or left, and there was a little area where cars could park and the kids played there while parents watched them out the windows. So he would have lived in the next kind of area over to the right of me. And because we were at such close proximity, we would just play outside, right, right outside of the windows, um, you know, especially during the spring and the summer when, when the, when the days were longer, um, we ended up playing just just close to the house. Were Marek and, and Radek from similar sorts of family to, to yours? Well, so Ma- Marek, I don't recall what his, what his family did. Uh, Radek was, a, I think he had a difficult life. Um, but his father, I believe, was just uh, a worker. Again, everybody had simple homes, including ours. So, you know, it's not like you were comparing, oh, you know, I have it better off than he does. And, and, you know, kids, kids for sure did that back then as well, but I didn't feel any better off or worse off than, than he did. Living in the old town, did you have your own bathroom facilities or was it shared? So. The flat that I re- remember when we first moved in, it was a shared bathroom. I think it was four stories and it was in between. It was tucked, kind of tucked in. So as you're going, we lived on the ground floor. So as you moved from the ground floor to the first floor in Poland, they called parter or ground floor. Um, there was a toilet just a toilet that the people from the ground floor and the first floor would utilize. And then there was a bathtub in the house. And later, my father did put proper toilet facilities in, in our apartment. So y- your father decides that life in Poland is, well, he, he, he decides that he wants to leave Poland and bring the family and take the family with him. How, how does, how does, can you remember him announcing that he was going to leave to try and find a better life for the family elsewhere? Yeah, that's, you know, I don't remember any announcements. I just remember Again, you know, what does a kid that's seven, eight years old really understand and comprehend that we were, we were to be moving to America. I didn't understand that concept. I was just, how do you, even to this day, just sitting and kind of reminiscing on that is, is, is a foreign concept, you know. (laughs) <laughs> is it across the street? Are we moving, you know, uh, you know, a couple miles down the road? Uh, what is America? Uh, um, it, it, it was, I don't think my brain was ready for what, what was about to happen to me, me personally, as an eight-year-old, nine-year-old kid. How easy was it? to just emigrate from Poland? Because, for example, if you were an East German, you couldn't just emigrate from East Germany easily. So how how did your your father implement this plan? So Poland wasn't as, I guess you could say, especially in the early 80s, it was nowhere near to what... Um, the people living in East Germany experience 
the fifties, the sixties, it was, it was, that was a different world altogether. And my father initially applied for a travel visa to go visit his siblings. Two aunts ended up in Austria and a brother ended up in uh, Germany. And he was denied travel permission due to the fact that his other family members left and never came back, came back. So, so he's that, got pre that, there was previous history there of <laughs> disappearing. Yeah, so he was, you know, I think even from a from a from an age stand, standpoint, he was, you know, the third child or fourth child. So, you know, there was they they essentially told him how he explained it to me that he will never see anything other than Poland. That was kind of the reassurance that the government gave him when he wanted to leave. So how does he get out? Because he does get out in 83. He made two attempts to essentially purchase travel visa from, I guess you can say, unscrupulous individuals that would enable his travel desires. Uh, the first time, you know, when my dad, you know, paid money to get, you know, proper paperwork to leave, they took the money and essentially told them, yeah, what are you going to do about it? You know, it's not like he could go and, uh, you know, get his money back. Uh, so after, after report after them to the police. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was, it was, you know, just. I guess a bad investment, the way my dad looked at it at the time. And uh, the, the second time it, 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 it worked. So he, he left, uh, Poland, uh, to stay with his, uh, with his family, uh, in Germany. He also gets to the United States, does he? Or is he in Germany then trying to get you and the rest of the family out? So while in Germany, he started, you know, uh, sending out letters, I think we called them sponsorships. My father ended up getting sponsored by the, uh, Catholic church in San Diego, which enabled to start the immigration process, interviewed my father and, you know, what his father did during the war and my dad said that that. The, the fact, you know, what my grandfather did during the war, my, my father felt that that was an important reason why, why they allowed for him to immigrate. But yeah, all, all those proceedings, as far as the immigration process, he, that, that was all started while he was in Germany. How did the, the, the rest of the family outside of your immediate family feel about the possibility of you all leaving Poland? Yeah, I don't think anybody was happy. Um, I remember my grandma wasn't happy. Yeah, n nobody was truly happy. Um, I wasn't happy. You know, again, I didn't understand, but the last thing that you know, I wanted was to leave my grandparents, my cousins, my my uncles, people that I, you know, considered, you know, these are the people that I spent the weekends with. These are the people that I went on vacations with. These were the people that raised me. It was a very close family bond. And now all of a sudden, <laughs> You know, we're going to leave, which it was traumatic experience. Everything that you're familiar with, you're going to be leaving behind and you've got no real knowledge as to what life in America is going to be like. Sure, sure. Can you remember that day or the days when you are leaving Poland and leaving Poznan? Yeah, I, uh, 
I mean, I remember that whole, that whole day we, uh, my aunt and my uncle, my mom, myself, and my sister, we took a train out of Poznań to Warsaw. I remember pulling out of the train station and I was seated. Um, the way, the way I was seated, I was able to kind of see the city kind of slowly disappear. Um, you know, out of my sight. And I remember crying as a kid, just looking out that window and, you know, looking at my town, the way I thought of it was, you know, this is kind of the last time though, that I'll see this. I think at that point it just kind of, I guess, sunk in or I understood what it meant to leave. And, and I remember that, you know, that, that's, the feeling and that 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 picture of the train kind of slowly moving out of the station and seeing the the city and the areas that I would ride my bicycle on or take walks with and these were the last moments that I had you know to to look at as as we headed headed out of town. Yeah, that, that uh, must have been a awful. Awful moment for you because you're, you're just moving off in, into the unknown. Did you take any like favorite toys with you? Yeah, no, no toys. Um, the only thing that I, that I took with me that I have to, to this day, I have this memory box it has a handful of pictures of my grandfather. Some of his, well, one of his, one of his medals that he received in World War II, or or soon after, I don't know that it's the Polonia Restituta Medal. It was dated in 1944, and an old watch of my grandfather's. I had a watch that I received after my first communion. Just a memory box of things. Uh, that was the only thing that I took with me, and that I, you know, that 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 I guess I could take because there were limitations, obviously, as far as what you could travel with. So the the train takes you to Warsaw because that's where the flights going to be going from. And is, are your your uncle and aunt are still with you there at that point? Yeah, so I remember we stayed that night in a hotel in Warsaw. And my uncle had one of those. As kids, we all drank tea because the water was not, I guess, suitable for consumption. I never remember drinking a glass of water in Poland. So from a young age, adults would drink coffee and the children would drink tea. So he had that little heating coil that he would stick into a glass to kind of boil the water. So I remember him making tea for me. Um, and then the following day, we took Swiss Air to Zurich and then Zurich to New York and then New York to San Diego. And this was the first time that you'd ever flown, I'm presuming. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, uh, that whole experience was very sur surreal. Not only was the first time I, I flown, but also I remember getting onto Swiss Air it was kind of the first time where I remember I had a kind of a proper meal. You know, I had a, they had this, this like cheese buffet. Um, I mean, I remember to this day, you know, eating the cheese on Swiss Air because again, we had, you know, the access to food, uh, was very, was very limited. Yeah. That must have been quite a culture shock for you all oh, right it's it's i can't you know looking at it and uh, now as a as a grown adult you know, father of two kids I, I i couldn't you know very i mean very very traumatic and very i, I don't know if i could do that to my kids i i just don't know and I guess the, it had to have been not 
such an unpleasant experience for my father that he felt that need to, to get, to get out. Have you shared your story with your kids? Do they understand where you came from and what hardships you had? And with the older one, we, I've, I've shared some stories with him, but it's typically met with, um, certain level of disbelief, then, you know, oh yeah, I've heard that one before. Uh, I don't think they really, I don't, I don't think you, I, I don't think unless you live a certain experience, I, I don't think most people could possibly comprehend, um, going through a moment like that as a, as a child, I just think it's, they can't conceptualize living that kind of life. It's hard to explain it. it it's hard to explain something that has been such a difficult thing for me into adulthood even. You're doing a great job explaining your experiences, uh, Norbert, but, but I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. I can't imagine going through some of the experiences that, that you've described, but by you sharing it, it is giving uh, me and the, and the listeners some, some great insight. So appreciate you, you, know, you know you sharing this story with us. Absolutely. So the plane lands in San Diego. Uh, you go to the cabin exit, yeah, and you step out onto those steps or whatever. What mm. what what is your immediate impression? So I don't remember an immediate impression that moment. I think that whole journey. And my sister was was a one year old at the time, so that was long flight in itself so new world new language you know, one year old crying i'm scared and my my father and my father's friend picked us up from the airport and kind of the first memory i have is as we're leaving the airport downtown san diego i think within five to seven minutes there is a freeway that goes out of downtown San Diego and it's, there's palm trees in the middle on the right and the left. And you have the San Diego, San Diego zoo on one side, Balboa park on the other side, and just, just these large green palm trees. Now, mind you, it's also November. So, so we left, it was cold, very cold. And now we're in San Diego, it's November and it's green. Uh, there's no leaves on the ground and it's not cold. The weather's nice. Uh, so that was the first very vivid lucid memory was driving down that short section between, uh, downtown San Diego. And as you're leaving the, the downtown area itself, it's just majestic, even to this day, kind of driving through it. Uh, I can't not think about when I landed and drove down that I rode the fir very first time. Wow. That's a great, great description. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, so w where are you living? Where, where is, has your dad got you some accommodation? So there were these, uh, right off the freeway, you're still going on. You, we lived in kind of older part of San Diego. There was this apartment complex that was owned by a, I guess, a Polish gentleman. I don't know if he was first generation or he also immigrated, but much earlier, he owned this apartment complex where I would say a vast majority of, of new immigrants, especially Poles, uh, lived in, had a pool, ping pong table, adults played on the weekends. And after work, um, but it was just kind of our little community. 
that was, I remember that vividly moving, moving there and, and then uh, kind of being in an environment where, you know, I understood everybody and I didn't feel, you know, like a total outcast. What was your dad doing for employment at this point? So when he, he came to San Diego, he worked as a dishwasher, was a German restaurant. The gentleman was of Polish descent and my father washed dishes in the, in the restaurant. And did your mother work at, at that point as well or, or not? Was she still stay at home? I guess with the young sister as well. Yeah, you know, initially my, my mom didn't work, but um, very, very, very soon, um, both of my parents were working, essentially. My, my father, especially, he was working six, seven days a week. Um, we, we didn't, uh, we ne after we came to America, we never went on a vacation because he worked, uh, he worked so hard, six, seven days a week, odd jobs, you know, he went from a, a dishwasher, he did a painting, he got a accounting degree and a, a city college and he drove a cab and managed uh, apartments and ended his career. He was a locksmith for, for 15 years. So he, 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 he worked very hard there just, yeah. just, you know, to, to, to give us what he felt was a, you know, a new, a new beginning, so to speak. Can you remember your first day at school in the United States? Yeah. So the school was a relatively close walking distance, I think. Well, I know my dad bought me a, a little skateboard, but uh, I went to elementary school and um, this would be f fourth grade now. Um, again, it was a different kind of San Diego has completely different architecture and and then the, what, what I was accustomed to, you know, I was accustomed to brick, bricks and masonry and concrete and everything here is, uh, you know, wooden, you know, two by fours and you know, layer of drywall, it's just, you know, it's kind of like the three little pigs. <laughs> Even to this day, it's, you know, when you knock on, knock on, knock on your wall, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's odd living. It just seems to, and again, it's, it, it's rooted in, uh, and, and with purpose due to earthquakes, but it's, Odd, nonetheless, coming from a country that, that is as old and has this, this exquisite architecture and uh, the way they build. And then here it was just, you know, very small buildings and uh, not as intimidating, I would say. It felt, felt mo more welcoming. How much English did you know at this point before you went to school? Yeah, so, so I knew... Uh, uh, well, I, I would say essentially zero English. Uh, my mother felt it would be beneficial for me to, you know, at least have some basic understanding of the language. So she, before we left, I remember that she signed me up for some private lessons with a gentleman that lived in the UK. Yeah. So I could learn proper English, uh, which didn't start out so well as I figured out very quickly in fourth grade. And um, but yeah, I I think it was high by, and that was kind of the extent of the two three lessons that I remember having in Poland. Right, and how how did the other kids at school react to you? Well, obviously not speaking the language was a difficulty in itself because you couldn't communicate to anyone. And I 
you know, one of my first memories I had in the classroom in fourth grade was uh, I needed a, I needed a, 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 an eraser. So I raised my hand and I asked the teacher if she can lend me a rubber, which, which didn't go over uh, <laughs> well whatsoever. You know, everybody started laughing again. I, I had no idea why, why the kids were laughing. Come to find out was, uh, and, you know, rubber did not mean what rubber meant in, in, in England. So that was, <laughs> yeah. So I, I cursed that chap, you know, to this day, you know, <laughs> my, my integration process, you know, from, from day one didn't go as planned because, uh. I was asking for a condom, not an eraser. <laughs> I mean, because you were different in the school, I, I guess, were they, were they, some people not, not nice to you because of your, you know, your, uh, your nationality? Yeah. So, you know, you got to remember this is 1985, so we're still in the midst of the cold war and, and, um, you know, politically, you know, that there was certain, you know, discussions that the American kids had at their home. And, um, you know, I, I was called a communist and, uh, you know, I, I went through a fair share. I guess I call it a, the testing period, right? Who, 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 who is this, who is this, you know, kid? And during that time, I remember there was a lot specific to San Diego. There was a lot of immigration from Vietnam. Um, I have some Russian friends to this day. And then there was a small percentage of, of Poles that immigrated to San Diego. But we're, we're talking about very, very minute percentages most most of the polish population ended up in chicago so did you make friends amongst the other minorities at school is that how you sort of got through yeah so and the first friend uh, what i would consider a friend or a person that kind of looked after me his name is joe and he was hawaiian so that's the first person i met that kind of befriended me and then uh, yeah it was it was we we tended to live in in poor neighborhoods in the 80s san diego was you know i don't know if you watched like the old you know movies but you know la and you know uh la san diego a lot of the west coast east coast cities had you know the slums and a uh, very poor, impoverished neighborhoods, that's where, that's where we live. And it was, you know, a lot of immigrants and a lot of minorities. And that, that was my kind of new family. Those are, those were the people that were accepted of me, uh, which was nice, you know, to finally feel like, you know, you have a, now, e even though it was strange and odd, it just felt it felt right for the first time. I, I felt I was very I was very sad that we left, but I felt I felt I felt comfortable. I felt you know sense of safety uh, for the first time in my life. Maybe even from you know simple reasons like you know having ample grocery stores and not using newspapers as toilet paper. You know the. <laughs> Those those little things that we take for granted for uh, these days. Did you have much contact with your family back in Poland? Were you writing to them or speaking to them on the phone? Was there much contact? Mind you, phone calls would have cost a fortune in those days. Yeah, so we did have a phone in Poland. And nor did we have a phone the first years in America. So I remember my dad would occasionally uh, make, make, uh, pay, pay phone phone calls. And gosh, I, 
they must have been astronomical because I remember just calling a different state back then was you know two dollars and seventy five cents for the first minute, and yeah, so calling was very rare, I would say, you know, in emergencies and or perhaps, you know, kind of holidays, kind of saying, you know, Merry Christmas to your family. And and I I had no contact. Maybe I wrote one letter. Um, my dad, I remember, gave me the hard time. He always said, oh, well, you know, you... <clears throat> You miss, you know, grandma and you miss everybody so much, but you don't write them. But, uh, you know, for my own sanity, I, the, the day I, I rolled out of that train station, that life ended for me. It, it, it had to end for me. Otherwise, it would have drove me mad. Yeah, it's a coping mechanism. <laughs> You know, I, I, I didn't know, you know, my, I, I know I felt bad when my dad said that you don't write, write letters, but I couldn't articulate that as a 10 year old. Um, I just somehow knew that for me to, to live this new life without even knowing that I might go back there one day, I just felt that I couldn't. I couldn't relive that memory, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. It was so painful. You didn't want to go through it again, the saying goodbye and all that sort of side. But you've been back to Poland since then. So yeah. Have you? Yeah. I, yeah. We went back in that. I remember we went back in 1989. I think it was, I don't know, late August or September. Me and my dad went, went uh, back to Poland. I think for two, three months, I think his mother was ill and he stayed at, at, uh, with, with his mother and I ended up standing, staying, uh, visiting with my, my grandmother, my mom's mom. And so in that apartment, it was my grandma, my mother's oldest sister, stepsister. My, my grandma's first husband died in early years of the war and then her son. So that was, that was, I really have a really good memory of, of, of 1989 because I was at that time 14 and, you know, all my cousins listened to the same, same music. And, uh, we just, I remember we just had a ball. Uh, it was just. Really, really, really fun time for me, 89. Yeah. When you came back, was it like you'd never been away or what, what was that experience of, of coming back? Yeah, so I, I remember, I think we landed in, in war. Yeah, we landed in Warsaw and it was just a typical Polish, or, you know, when you're crossing with, you know, boundaries into a different country and it's just these, Soldiers, the military presence everywhere at the airport. I remember they were scrutinizing my father uh, as far as what you know we were bringing it in, and just the whole process is just it's it it um, that whole military aspect just filled you know that sense of uneasiness for me um, coming in. But then once once I was with family, it was it just. In a way, it it picked up where or, or, or kind of left off because everybody was still living in the same blocks, and uh, that didn't change. And the rooms and the way you know my grandma had it in her house, and my aunt in in her house, it was kind of like I was gone for a week, and now I could pick up again with my cousins and do the kind of stuff that we used to do as kids when we were little. Now we know there's music involved, then we all shared the same love of music. So, you know, we spend a lot of time just running around and with our Walkmans. And even back then in Poland, you couldn't buy authentic cassettes. The cassettes and vinyl, you know, was out at the time. So they had shops where you could uh, 
you know, bring in a blank cassette, like a TDK or a bass cassette blank. And then you'd pick, pick an album and they would, you know, <laughs> they would, you know, make you a pirated copy. You know, you come back a couple hours later and pay him a small fee. That's kind of how we got our music or everybody got their music back then. And that was a huge, huge kind of aspect of, of my childhood was, was music. Did you, uh, find Radek at that time or not? Yeah, we, we, we did. We, I, I, I found him. He still lived in the same spot. And I remember we went to visit my, uh, first, first grade teacher and I really liked her. And I don't know why she was just a nice, pleasant lady. I, she was well read. I remember when we visited her, her apartment, she had books everywhere and she was just very, uh, modest, very, just a very nice, kind person. And, and I do, that was the one thing that I was remembered was that one teacher. And to this day, I've always wondered what happened to her. She'd probably be in her, gosh, late sixties, maybe. Yeah. Probably late sixties. Um, but I remember I got, I got a chance to see her and I really, really like that. But yeah, it was, you know, for me, you know, catching up with my, my childhood friend and, you know, the family and the cousins, it was, it was definitely one of the most memorable uh, moments in my life. Going back still and being able to live that life as that kid. Because thereafter, once everybody went to college and, you know, th the adult life took on that, then <clears throat> that no longer, I didn't belong there anymore, essentially. It, it became too different. There was too much of a gap. Correct. Yeah. And you're so, still in contact with Radek as well, aren't you? Not, not, not as, not as much as, as I'd like. Uh, he's in Warsaw, I believe still. Um, we did have some extensive conversations over the last decade, I would say. So it's kind of, you know, how are things kind of, kind of thing that makes sense. Um, and that's the one thing that I wish that, uh, you know, that we w had that better relationship, friendship, but it's, you know, it's not easy, um, keeping that alive at, at such distance. And, you know, just in recent, recent years with, with, you know, technology and, you know, here we are sitting, you're in the UK, I'm, I'm in San Diego. Uh, we can have a conversation that, that even discussion in the nineties, just people would think that you're crazy, that you could sit in your car and have a two, three hour conversation for free, <laughs> essentially. Um, yeah. Yeah. Across continents. Yeah. 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 Especially when it was $2 to call the next state, as you said, <laughs> um, <laughs> For, for the first minute. Um, can you remember where you were when you heard that the Berlin Wall had opened? Yeah, so so again, we would spend the weekends and a lot, of, I would spend a lot of time in 89, just with my, I would wake up, you know, I had the cousin with my grandma and then we would either both walk to my aunt's house or were they, they're they, daily, and I remember, you know, we're kind of all playing and watching TV, and they, they started, you know, showing, you know, news news clips of the wall being, you know, they were, you know, hammering at the wall. So I don't know why what happened. I guess there was some commotion out outside, but you know, everybody left the blocks, and I remember everybody was screaming and shooting fireworks off. And, uh, again, I didn't, you know, at the time, you know, even at 14, uh, um, you know, you didn't quite understand what, what all the commotion was about. 
<laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And and I re- I also re- remember you know, uh, you know the uh, the the fate of Ceausescu. I, they they show I think they showed more than they sh- they would have today of uh, his uh, ultimate demise. When you when you came back to Poland in eighty nine, had you got U.S. citizenship at that point? No, we were we were at that point we had uh, the green card, uh, permanent residency, um, still. So I came so I came back to uh, Poland and the Polish passport still. Yeah. So how long did the process take for you to get U.S. citizenship? At that time, if I recall correctly, I think it was five or seven years. I think. Uh, I ended up getting it, I think after high school, um, strictly for economic reasons, because I think even at that time it was $700, five or $700 for the whole process. And then you had to, uh, you know, you need to also allocate some time cause you had to, um, you know, take the test and, uh, so I read the U.S. Constitution. You know, over the years, you know, I you read the U.S. Constitution and, and uh, you know, you had a whole booklet of the things that, you know, you should read, uh, which I was already interested in. So, um, you know, that aspect I wasn't concerned about. And then while during the interview process, they, they evaluated your grasp of the English language and then... Um, then obviously you had to pay the processing fee for whatever whatever that amount was. I remember it was substantial to us. Um, and at, at that point, is that when you felt that you were an American or did you still think you were Polish living in the United States? Or, or do, you yeah. still, do you still have, presumably you must still have pride in that in the nationality that you were born with. Yeah. 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 That's a hard one. You know, I've been having a lot of, you know, talks with my aunt specifically because honestly, you know, in Poland, I don't know if, you know, what my fa- grandfather and father experienced and I experienced to a certain extent because of our, Prussian German heritage, you know, we weren't necessarily looked at as real Pauls. Um, it wasn't for me, it wasn't as bad. Um, but you know, very quickly living in America, you know, I felt, I kind of felt at home. I, when, when we came in 85, again, we didn't have any money. I remember going, there was a school assembly and they had uh, Boy Scouts and they were, I think they brought a tent or a monkey bridge. Essentially, it's just a simple bridge made with uh, two and two logs and then a, a lead rope through it. You know, you can do it across canyons, whatnot. And that really sparked my interest because it was free. And I, you know, I knew I could come to my dad and go, hey, dad. You know, can I join this, this group? It's free because I wanted to be out. I didn't want to be stuck in 1980s, uh, you know, 90s or 2000s. I didn't want to be cooked up at home. I wanted to go out and explore and, and see the country and sleep underneath the stars. And I, I got, I got to see a lot of America that way through Boy Scouts, a lot of America. And simply was because we were so poor that my dad couldn't afford to sign me up for like soccer or lessons or, or piano or some other activities. So I'm glad that organization was, was there because it, it gave me, um, it, I think the best education that I received as a kid, you know, it, it, it helped me heal in ways that. I, I I wasn't able to understand until I got as I got an adult. It it gave me friendships. It gave me a purpose. It gave me a, 
Um, let me forget. Let me forget. Yeah, I, no, but I really appreciate you sharing your your story with me today. You know, it, it's. I know it, it it it's a challenge for you to to go through this, but you were really keen to want to share this with me, and I hope me speaking with you, you know, has in in some way helped you with that. Yeah, it 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 did because for many years it, it was it it's I can't explain how difficult you know the time you know the Cold War the kind of discussions that I've heard on on your show that's not necessarily the time as a child that I can remember and have good memories or bad memories. Obviously, there are things that were, even as a kid, that you could see that something wasn't the way it should. But when we moved here, it was many years of, of, of questioning why, you know, I started chasing the why, why everything happened the way it happened. And it was a lot of resentment, a lot of anger, I would say. And then, uh, you know, finding that forgiveness for my dad because he did it with the best intentions for his family. He felt that this needed to be done for us to be safe. And I think he accomplished that mission and uh, I was able to, well, once I understood everything, uh, I was able to, I guess, understand why he did what he did. Uh, and and forgive him for that, because I, I I didn't have that choice. Right? I didn't I did not want to leave. And I think it's critical to understand. Um, again, I've never met anybody like me. I met I, like me from Poland. Um, I've met other immigrants, obviously, and that was, you know, a huge struggle for all those people that immigrated, how we immigrated was that loss and that longing and, and, and that's the commonality that we all had was, was that, that pain. As, 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 as I grew and as, as I read, as I researched, as I talked to my father and as I, um, you know, rekindled those relationships with my cousins and my aunts as an adult, you know, and now I had a clear, better picture, understanding why he made the choices that he made and how, how we got here. For me, you know, if my kids ever get a chance to listen to this, um, um you know, that I, I made all the decisions as a father to make sure that my kids had as little. They didn't move around at all. I think my oldest sons lived in two places and we've all li lived within, you know, maybe three square kilometers area of San Diego to give them that security that, um, that life that I didn't have, I felt it was my mission that if I were to have kids, if possible, not to ever have them go through what I went through because it was so, so hard. It was so hard. And if they did, you know, then how many years would it take for them to understand that? your father, your grandfather, your grand, great-grandfather made 
these decisions based on uh, what they felt was right. And I thought that was very important for me that if I had kids that they would have that safety, that family um, with them at all time. It's not about, you know, the things, you know, it's like, no, nobody got rich by that. My dad definitely didn't get rich. Uh, my, 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 we, we, we essentially, you know, traded for what I was told a life of, you know, semi comfort, even though, you know, poor was poor. And even if you had money, you still could buy certain things. But I think that we would have been from a financial standpoint, we would have fared a lot better there. Um, but my dad, you know, just speaking to him over the last couple of weeks, I asked him if he, if he would do it the same way again. Uh, he looked at me and he said, yes, that he has zero um, resentment how how it happened and and I and I was specific when I asked him I said and knowing knowing what you know how it made me feel how difficult it was for me and he looked at me and he said yes and uh, <laughs> you know one thing you have to hand, hand to somebody like that was that you know my dad was always tough but fair and um, I know he did the right decision because he did it to protect his family. And that's what he felt he needed to do at that time to provide that comfort and safety. And, 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 and when I became a father, I did things for my kids that I think my dad would have loved to do, but just, just couldn't because, you know, uh, the life of an immigrant back then wasn't easy and he sacrificed his life so we could have that better life, which I think, eh, you know, I, I think, you know, my kids uh, have realized what it, what it means, I guess, to have that American dream. And for me, it's always been, been a family. So now that my parents are living with us. There's six of us in our house, and for financial reasons, my my parents uh, moved in with us three months ago. And that, that's kind of the uh, circle of that journey. Don't miss the episode extras, such as videos, photos, and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters, and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening, and see you next week.